This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The legal information presented on In Legal Terms is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information conveyed does not create any type of attorney-client relationship. Please consult an attorney provider before making any decisions about your specific legal questions. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio, the show all about you and your rights. I'm Liz Gill with Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. Hello, Professor Gershon. Good morning, Liz. It is great to see the sunshine. It is, uh, you know, as much as we all uh, Southerners enjoy snow occasionally, it was good to get get it out of here. And uh, glad to ha- always glad to have uh, Kelly Kyle on the show, of Kyle Wynn and Associates. Uh, you know, last time Kelly was on the show was in March of 2020, right as we were going into the pandemic and things were shutting down. And I doubt any of us thought we'd still be somewhat in this position in 2021, but I think we're getting to where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And Kelly, it's always great to have you on the show. Can you please remind us about your background and your practice areas? Thank you, Richard. It's always great to be on here. It's hard for me to believe that it's been a year uh, since I appeared. But um, thanks for the invite once again. I am a partner in the law firm of uh, Kyle Wynn and Associates, and we have an office in Madison, Mississippi. That's our primary office. But we have satellite offices around the state. We're also down on the Gulf Coast at Diamond Head. We have an office up in Hernando as well. And being licensed in Louisiana, I also have an office over in my hometown of Arcadia, Louisiana. And um, our firm has been around for about 40 years, but uh, we specialize in estate planning and elder law issues, all of those issues uh, affecting people as they age, um, estate planning, trust, uh, just we call ourselves a, a full service elder law and estate planning firm. You know, I used to laugh at the idea of elder law and, uh, and the idea of aging, but realized that it's something we all do. And it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, over the last 40 years, I've definitely aged. Uh, yes. So <laughs> it just happens. And, uh, you know, and today, you know, while we uh, are thinking about, you know, disability planning and things like that, we're, we're talking about estate planning generally. Um, and in these uncertain times, you know, it, it seems like, you know, this is especially important for people to think about estate planning. Absolutely. And, you know, COVID has really brought that home to everybody. Uh, we have just seen the effects in our practice of people um, becoming incapacitated or passing away and not having an estate plan at all, or maybe not having an estate plan um, that covers everything. So, um, you know, it, it's definitely something that everyone needs to think about. This morning, we're talking about trusts, probate, powers of attorney, advanced health care directives with our guest, attorney Kelly Kyle from Kyle Wynn. You can send us an email to legalterms at mpbonline.org. We do already have a call, and it's Shirley from Starkville. Shirley, we appreciate you calling in and listening to In Legal Terms. What's your comment or question? Well, I appreciate your having this program, so thank you. Um, My question uh, has to do uh, with uh, the laws in other states uh, in comparison with those in Mississippi. I was named executrix. Uh, for my 99-year-old aunt who lived in another state. Uh, She was a widow. Um, uh, My uncle predeceased her, uh, and they had no children. So I don't know if this has anything to do with the question I'm about to ask. Also, I had helped her her to move from their home to uh, a senior citizen's uh, apartment. Now... When she became ill unto death, uh, um, you know, I had to have her placed in hospice. And um, if I can give this plug, in Collierville, Tennessee, uh, the Baptist Collierville, it was a beautiful place, and she she passed away with dignity. Now, that my question is um, uh, whether or not in the state of Mississippi one can signed a, a trust uh, 
because this is what her attorney had me to do. Even though she had a will, she had named me executrix, uh, and I was to distribute, you know, all the um, various things of her estate. He said she, I need to have her to sign a trust. That way, uh, that will obviate your need of having to go to probate court. And sure enough, uh, after when I was settling her estate, I never had to leave Mississippi to go to ten, Tennessee uh, to do that for her. So in the state of Mississippi, I'm thinking now about my own mortality. Uh, and I'm wondering uh, for uh, my own, uh, you know, children's sakes, they live in several in different states from what I do. So if I... Um, have a will in, a, in addition to a trust, if I get a trust, will that obviate their need to go uh, to probate court when I pass away? Does that make sense? What a great question. And um, Shirley, it is exactly uh, just right along the lines of, of what my firm does. We wholeheartedly advocate the use of a revocable living trust for most of our clients as a way of doing exactly what you said uh, you were advised to do, avoid probate. And um, I guess you have seen the benefit of doing it that way. You said when your aunt passed away uh, under the terms of the trust, you were able to distribute the property the way that she had said that it would be done. You did not have to uh, go to court, didn't even have to go to the other lawyer's office in Memphis. and. Um, your question as to whether or not you can do that in Mississippi, absolutely you can. And with COVID uh, recently, we have seen the comparison in families that are having to go to probate after a loved one has passed away, either with a will or maybe without one. And that just opens up a process that they have to go through. It's many months long. Um, Richard and I share the uh, habit of, of telling clients this. We say it takes nine months to come into this world and nine months to go out because that's about the minimum amount of time that it's going to take for an estate to go through probate. It can be much longer than that. But um, again, we're seeing clients that are having to go through the probate process because their family members uh, didn't do complete planning we're seeing family members that are able to avoid that whole process by having a trust. And the difference is night and day. Um, I had a gentleman in, uh, his mother was in her 90s when we did her trust a couple of years ago. She passed away between Christmas and New Year of this year. And uh, we have already completely wrapped up all of her affairs compared to, um, you know, again, someone that's having to start this process and may or may not finish it within uh, the calendar year 2021. So it does make a huge difference. A trust is a great way to plan your estate. Practically everyone can benefit from doing estate planning that way. And I may have given you a, a very long answer to a short question, but I, I thought it was deserving of that amount of attention because it's really something everyone should do. Just to follow up briefly, so then one needs a power of attorney, a will, and a revocable living trust. Absolutely. Shirley, could I possibly engage you to come in and, and spread the word for my law firm because you've captured it as a layman better than anyone I've ever heard before? Okay. Thank you so much <laughs> for your time this morning. <laughs> Thank you for your call. And Shirley is not a paid representative of the Kyle Wynn Associates, but uh, but she, maybe she could be in the future because she did such a good job of recapping that. Let's go she to really did. let's go to Jonathan in Columbus. Jonathan, thank you for calling in to In Legal Terms. What's your comment or question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, I probably have the easiest question of the morning. It's probably going to be a layup for your esteemed guest here, uh, but I can't seem to get a clear and direct answer from Google on it, um, but uh, uh, my mother has a, I think, $125,000 or $150,000 life insurance uh, policy on me that she's had for probably about 20 plus years now. Uh, she lives in another state. Um, I'm currently here in Mississippi uh, um, 
uh, in a house with my girlfriend. Uh, we have been together for about seven years now. Um, we are planning to get married here at some point, but my question is, if I make a will and I, you know, kick off, I guess, before uh, the actual marriage is finalized and we're not really joined in that way, if in the will it stipulates that everything that I have or all of my, you know, worldly goods and possessions and accounts and whatnot uh, go to her, does that mean that it will go to her? even though the life insurance policy is still in my mom's name that she says she's not going to sign over essentially to me until I'm married. Jonathan, are, when you're saying does it go to her, do you mean the girlfriend? No. Uh, my mother or is your the mom. Beneficiary. Yeah, my mother is the beneficiary of my life insurance policy. My question is, if I have a will that states that my, my girlfriend, you know, soon-to-be wife, uh, you know, you know, basically gets, you know, worldly goods and possessions of mine. If I, you know, die before that actual marriage occurs, uh, does that okay. will override her, my mom, as the beneficiary? Okay. A um, couple of things to talk about here. Any asset that has a beneficiary designation on it stays outside of the probate process. So you could do a will that says I leave the proceeds of my life insurance policy to my girlfriend, but if your mom is listed as the beneficiary on it, it's going to mom no matter what that will says. So um, that's the answer to that question. Now you can uh, do a will and um, leave things to your girlfriend and um, you know, if you own a home uh, and it's solely in your name and you want the girlfriend to uh, receive that, then you can uh, you can do that. And it would go to her, but it would have to go through the probate process. Um, does that answer your question? I, I was trying to see if that covered everything that you were asking. Yes, sir, that did. Okay. Well, thank you for your call. Uh, hope we were able to provide you with some good information. Thank you, Jonathan. We appreciate you calling in. You can send us an email to legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're talking about having your wishes respected if you become incapacitated or when you die with our guest attorney, Kelly Kyle. And I find the odd and the unusual fascinating. Two years ago this week, a celebrity left his cat a large of money amount of money in his will. I'm going to tell you more about that. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee only financial advising firm and co host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart devices podcasting platform. This is In Legal Terms. Not everyone has a chance to listen to our show live. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show at inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. It's also available on the MPB Public Media app, as are all our local shows. I'm Liz Gill, here with Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. 
the late fashion designer Carl Lagerfeld, creative director for Fendi and Chanel, has left some of his $200 million fortune to his cat, which I thought was interesting, but the cat already had its own fortune of $3 million for doing advertisements for a German car firm and Japanese cosmetics brand. So I guess in your will, in your will, you can leave anything to anybody that you want to, Kelly? You know, that's interesting, Liz. It seems that I remember Leona Helmsley. Remember the uh, New York City Hotel Queen? They called her the Queen of Mean and um, because she was apparently just really horrible to people. Um, and I think she cut a grandchild out of her will, but I think she left a pretty large amount of money to her dog, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. <laughs> but um, that's not really a good idea. There are all sorts of legal problems when you leave money to a, a non-human uh, entity. Let's let's say that you can leave it to a charity, you can leave it to people, but it's not a really good idea to leave it to an animal. Well, heard, if I can interject, one thing yeah. though that, that does make sense is uh, a trust for a, an animal. Though it does make sense, so you know if, if you set up an, a, a situation where you're, you're an older person, you don't have maybe any anyone else with you, but you've got pets who may outlive you, uh, to put money in a trust for so that someone else can care for them without having it cost money to the person who takes care of your animal is a good idea, um, and that really I hope is what actually happen with uh, Helmsley and people like that. I don't want to get into the rule against perpetuities, but actually a gift to uh, a gift to an animal actually will violate the rule against perpetuities because it's not a life and being and and uh, and it won't necessarily vest within 21 years if the pet lives beyond that 21 year period. That is more information than anybody wanted about that particular rule. <laughs> yeah, the, the rule against perpetuities is not something that comes up in everyday conversation, at least among non-lawyers and a lot of times not even among non-law students. Uh, it's one of those things we learn early on but kind of forget. But yeah, thank you for mentioning the part about leaving uh, a provision in your trust for your pets. I've done that in my own plan. Uh, my animals are very important to me. Um, so I've provided for them to be taken care of if something happens to me. Uh, I've done the same for lots of other clients. So, um, yeah, if your pets are a part of the family, as they should be, and you want to provide for them, that's something that certainly can be done. This morning, we're talking about wills, bequeaths, probate, living wills with our guest, Kelly Kyle from Kyle Winnen Associates. We've got full phone lines, so let's go right to Annette in Madison. Annette, thank you for calling in to In Legal Terms. What's your comment or question? Well, praise the Lord and join the program today. I was really wanting advice, maybe more so than a question. I have a situation where I have a brother that has recently moved back to Mississippi, have been gone for about 42 years, separated from his wife, was diagnosed with cancer during the holidays. I have been taking him back and forth to the doctor, but I'm wondering power of attorney because that question came up who were your power of attorney i don't want to overstep my bonds because he bounds because he has a wife but they're separated so should i this is my question uh try to get be a power of attorney to let the doctors know because he's having to have chemo and radiation at the same time he's like third uh stage cancer so i'm going like should i be the power of attorney should what do how do i go about having this done can i pull it off the internet has it notarized so that's where i am that's my question a very good question and i'm sorry you and your family are, are going through that but um especially when someone has a critical illness that is the time to make sure that these things are all taken care of and uh yes i would say getting an advanced health care directive should be really top of mind for you and your brother. Um, the Advanced Healthcare Directive is a document that um, says who can make decisions for your brother when he's not able to make them for himself. Um, and it's also his opportunity to say what he would want done in certain situations. He can uh, specify whether he would, when he gets to the point, as we all will, that um, 
you know, he's he's uh, being possibly kept alive by machines, he can say whether or not he would want that to continue. He can specify whether he would want to receive artificial nutrition and hydration. And it's important that these things actually be in writing. Um, and the advanced healthcare directive is the way to do that. You could probably find um, a form like that on the internet, but um, Annette, with you being right here in Madison, uh, that's something that I would be more than happy to provide for you um, at no cost. So, you well, know, just, just as yeah. a, a service that I could do to you and your family. So um, let me just give you my phone number and, and call me later today when we're off the show. Call me at 601-978-1700. And, you know, you could get that on the Internet, but it may not be complete. Um, there are some little intricacies when it comes down to proper execution of it witnessing, notarizing, and stuff like that. So let's just get you a document done correctly that will work when your time comes. Um, it, it's better to, to have it done right, make sure that uh, it will work when it's needed than to try to do it yourself. Well, I just want to say thank you. I'm in tears. I um, have been very stressed about it, and uh, may God continue to bless you for given going what they call the olive branch i'm willing to pay but i just want to say thank you for what you do well, well we you're, you're very welcome annette i'll look forward to talking with you um maybe give me a call this afternoon i have an appointment or two after the show but i'll be happy to talk with you later today thank you all so much enjoy the program thank you again thank you we're gonna now go um, to I really go ahead no, I was just going to say, uh, I hate to hear the situation that she and her family are, are going through. So if I can provide her with that advanced health care directive as, as just a, a small service, I'm happy to do that. But um, while we're on this topic, let's just talk about the other things that people need while um, possibly dealing with incapacity. That uh, advanced health care directive is crucial for dealing with the medical issues. Uh, people also need, uh, at a bare minimum, a power of attorney to ensure that business matters can be taken care of as well. But um, just as a, a little caveat there, one of the problems that we see with people uh, and their powers of attorney, if they get one off the Internet, it may not be complete. It may not be properly executed. And there's another problem with powers of attorney, and that is that people are not obligated to accept a power of attorney when it's presented to them. So that's another reason for doing a trust. Um, that trust can get around that problem of the power of attorney not being honored. Let's go to Van Cleve and speak with Wilson. Wilson, thank you so much for calling in to In Legal Terms today. What's your comment or question? Uh, thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I have a legal doozy for you here. Um, my wife's father recently passed away uh, uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, from COVID. Um, he left his house to my wife, her sister, and her brother, her siblings. Um, but in the will, it states that his recent wife can live in the house till she dies. And there's about $60,000 owed on the house. What kind of legal quagmire is this? Well, it's one that we see uh, fairly often. Uh, you know, people, uh, maybe a, a spouse passes away and, uh, and or there's a divorce and uh, they marry later in life and want to pass the asset itself onto their children but not uh, put their current spouse out in the cold. So uh, that's a very typical situation. Um, the spouse who will have the right to live there for the remainder of her life is what we call a life tenant. And um, 
normally she would have the obligation to sort of keep the property up, make sure that it, it stays in good repair, possibly even pay the taxes, insurance, and stuff like that on it. I don't know if your father-in-law left any guidance along those lines um, in the will. But, um, you know, it's a common thing that we see, and um, it, it can get involved, especially if all the, the parties are not necessarily on the same page. There can be some conflicts there. But um, if your father-in-law left a will, then that will will need to be probated. And um, the court may be involved in setting some of the parameters as to Whose, whose, whose responsibility the taxes, insurance, and things like that are. Okay, because uh, in his will, he left all of his assets to his children. Um, right. Uh, now, she, but, she was given 49% of his retirement and so forth and uh, all of that. Uh, so she's well taken care of. Uh, but the issue of the house and his... And his uh, his assets, uh, other assets, are, are in question, and uh, and we feel we didn't want to have to go to court and all of this stuff. But I don't know. I think we we may be headed that way. Yeah. Um, when someone dies with a will, um, that will is not some magical document that can simply make those things happen. Uh, the instructions in the will have to be carried out. Um, in court, and you know, it's a, it takes a decree of the court to actually appoint the executor, and a decree of the court to actually uh, distribute those assets. So, um, all of those things are things that will have to be dealt with in that probate process. Okay, thank you so very much for your answer, and I uh, I appreciate your your program, and God's blessings to all of you. Thanks for your call. This is Liz's question. It, the The mortgage, is that a debt of the individual who died and the mortgage would need to be paid from the assets of the individual who died? Well, I guess that would depend on the mortgage document. Um, the deceased may have been the sole borrower on there, the sole obligor, so... Um, it would certainly be in his children's interest to continue paying that mortgage payment because uh, they're the ones that will actually own the property. It's just subject to uh, the stepmother's right to live there uh, for as long as she lives. So it, it's kind of a complicated question. Hey, Kelly, it might be. I mean, one thing that they need to look at with that uh, mortgage, it might be a pay, due on death clause as well. Some, some mortgages are due when someone dies and they got to pay off the whole thing unless they refinance it. So, you know, it just Good depends point. on that. Right. So, and that's uh, why we have these there. experts here. <laughs> that's why we have these experts so you can call in and ask the questions. Email us your questions. The address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. Even if we can't get to them on the air, we forward them to our experts and they'll get back to you. We're talking with attorney Kelly Kyle about wills, trusts, advanced health care directives. Now, it is great to listen to this show, but sometimes you just want to take your time and maybe read a book about the subject. I've got a book to suggest for you next. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. 
On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill. We hope that you'll subscribe to our podcast. There's lots of different podcasting platforms out there. I happen to like Podcast Addict. A podcast is just some kind of recorded material that you can listen to again. You can downcast, you can download a platform to your smart device, uh, touch the plus that takes you to the page to search for podcasts. Then I typed in in legal terms in the search area. It brought up our show. I'm able to touch the photo, then subscribe, and I'm notified when any uh, new episodes are loaded up. This morning, we are talking about estates, probates, and trusts with our guest, attorney Kelly Kyle. But, you know, if you'd like to do some reading, if you'd like some reading material, our guest is a co-author. Consider reading his book, How to Protect Your Family's Assets from Devastating Nursing Home Costs, Medicaid Secrets, the Mississippi edition. We have lots of phone calls to get to today. We're going to go to Margo in Memphis, Tennessee right now. Margo, thanks for calling in to In Legal Terms. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, my husband has mid-stage dementia, and we have a large sum in assets, but we do not have long-term health care insurance. And I'm trying to figure out how we can protect those assets from being consumed by potential long-term care. Margo, that is a problem that a lot of families face. Um, I don't know if you've done any any investigation into long-term care, but nursing home costs here in Mississippi, Tennessee, um, can run anywhere from eight to ten thousand dollars per month or more. And uh, right. that book that Liz mentioned just a moment ago is one yeah. that my law firm has put out for a number of years. It deals specifically with Mississippi. Medicaid. And the reason we did that book was because there's so much information out there available on the internet, but every state has their own rules. It's a federally funded program, Medicaid, but every state writes their own rules for it. So the information that you may find in a Google search uh, may be applicable in Texas and not in Tennessee. So uh, a a state-specific guide is really necessary. Now, my law partner is licensed in Tennessee, so I would defer any specific questions uh, to her, but I can tell you the general principles are are pretty similar uh, from state to state. Um, Not having long-term care insurance uh, now means that uh, you really have two ways of having his long-term care cost paid if and when the need arises and that would be private payment where you simply write a check for as we said before eight or ten thousand dollars or more per month or the other alternative is medicaid and um people seem to think that medicaid is only for people whose assets and income are just at the poverty level but that is not true we try to let people know that with some planning um, we can get practically anybody qualified for Medicaid benefits. Um, Another uh, bit of misinformation that's out there is that you have to get everything out of your name five years before someone needs to go to the nursing home. And that's not true either. We can get people qualified um, in, in much less than five years. I would just tell you, you know, you just really need to sit down with someone who is competent in this area. There are a lot of people that think they know what they're doing when it comes to Medicaid, but unfortunately they don't. And following bad advice can get you in really uh, bad trouble and um, can cost you a lot of money. So again, my law partner is licensed in Tennessee. And um, if you would like to have a consultation with us, we could certainly arrange that. In fact, I know she's going to be in our Hernando office before uh, just in another week or so. So if you'd like to give us a call, we would be happy to uh, go over those issues with you. 
Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your call. We're going to move on to Oxford and speak with Jenna now. Jenna, thank you so much for calling into In Legal Terms. Go ahead. Hello. Hi, Jenna. Thanks for calling into In Legal Terms. You're on the air with attorney Kelly Kyle and Professor Richard Gershon. What's your question about wills and estates and trusts? Yes. Um, I, um, I am 75 years old. and I'm Where's Jenna? Hello? Hello? Jenna, what's your question? Yes, my question is that um, I own um, several um, rental properties, um, and I am 75 years old, and I also um, have, and, and I have also have a company that manage these uh, rental properties, and I am thinking, would it, would it be uh, a good idea to put all these properties in the, uh, in the trust? Uh, Jenna, what type of company are you talking about? Is it an LLC, a limited liability company that yeah. owns your rentals? Right, uh, the LLC that, uh, that, that uh, manage uh, all these uh, houses, the rental houses. Okay, and, so and um, your purpose in asking about a trust, is it just simply to avoid probate, or, or are you looking at yes. uh, asset protection, or, or what's your, your goal there? It might be both. Um, I, um, I have uh, three children, and, uh, uh, and one of the children is it's sort of like it's trying to cause a problem. Uh, with the uh, with the uh, asset, and so I was thinking of putting all this property in the um, the um, in the trust, and um, and uh, and and hire the company to to manage it, uh, rather than put all this property in the trust. Uh, what what would you advise for me? Okay. Well, um, a trust would certainly be a, a good way of managing those assets during your lifetime and then also ensuring that your wishes are carried out after you pass away. One of the uh, things that popped up as, as I was making notes here about your situation was you indicated that you had one child that might cause a problem later on. And um, if right. you were concerned that that child might try to get a greater share than what you wanted them to receive and you wanted to, again to be sure that your wishes would be carried out a trust is a great way to do that because um again the trust avoids probate it keeps things right. out of court and um all of our trusts also include a a very strong no contest clause in there that's designed to prevent a beneficiary from uh, contesting your wishes. So your trust could be um, a, a great benefit during your lifetime. It would hold all of your assets and protect them from uh, what might happen if you became incapacitated. It could keep things out of the probate process after you pass away. And again, ensure that your wishes would be carried out. As far as um, limiting your liability, well, you've already taken the first step that I would have recommended there, and that is putting those properties into a limited liability company, which does exactly what its name implies. It limits your personal liability. So if you had an injury at um, one of your rental properties um, and someone sued you, and I'm sure you have insurance, but if they obtained a judgment that was in excess of your liability coverage, they could only get what's in the LLC. They couldn't come after your personal assets. So it sounds like you've, you've got the bases covered uh, to begin with, but uh, you might be able to benefit from a little bit of uh, additional planning. Jenna, thank you so much for calling in. We appreciate you calling in to get your questions answered on in legal terms. We are running out of time for this show, so if you would like to send us an email, our address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. This morning, we're talking about estates, probates, and trusts with our guest, attorney Kelly Kyle. Would you like to hear more about this topic? 
We'll tell you how next. This is In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Thank you for being a part of In Legal Terms. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show. Inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. It's also available on the MPB Public Media app, as are all our local shows. I'm Liz Gill here with Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law at 10 a.m. Central on Tuesdays following our show. You can hear Southern Remedy, relatively speaking, with Dr. Susan Buttress on MPB Think Radio. We so much enjoy having Kelly Kyle on our program so that we can ask him all these questions. And if you like, you can listen to past podcasts from when he's been on In Legal Terms. On March 27, 2018, we had Avoiding Probate. March 5, 2019, we had Wills in Probate. On November 26, 2019, we had revocable revocable trusts. And in last year, on March 31st, 2020, we had medical directives. And I guess maybe maybe this one we'll call advanced health care directives. That uh, seems to be what we've had a lot of conversations about with attorney Kelly Kyle from Kyle Wynn. We have two more phone calls to round out our show. Let's go to Bobby in Pontotoc. Bobby, thank you so much for calling into In Legal Terms. Go ahead. Oh. I've got a, a kind of a weird question. I got a niece whose husband died, and she's trying to get her house in probate court so she can sell it. And she, her, her husband has a mentally ill daughter from another marriage, and for some reason that mentally ill daughter is holding that up. Do you have any idea how she's doing that? The daughter, I'm assuming, would be... Um a, a party to that probate. One of the big questions, I guess, that we have to establish first is whether or not um, your niece's husband had a will when he died. Do you know the answer to that? No, he did not have a will. That's part of the problem. That's what okay. He if he didn't have, him. yeah. If he did not have a will, then his estate is what we call intestate, it means dying without a will. So under Mississippi law, your niece who would have been his spouse and his daughter would be called his heirs at law. And um, so they would inherit the property equally. Now, um, again, there's another question we may not know the answer to. I'm assuming that the house was solely in the husband's name. So again, that means that your niece and the husband's daughter are going to own that property jointly. And, um, you know, they're, they're just things that have to be done in the probate process. And um, if the daughter is mentally ill, I don't know if she's to the point of requiring a guardian to look after her interests, but um, that could have a, a big bearing on it as well. Yeah, well, I, I got one more question now. Let's go. There's an there's a insurance company here and in, in keeps advertising on TV. Return of premium insurance. Is that a scam or is that true? Bobby, I don't know enough about that to give you an answer. I, number one, I haven't seen the uh, advertisement and um, I don't know a lot about that type of insurance. Well, they said that. I wish I could help you. They said if that 
uh, uh, insurance ran out before you died, you get your whole premium back. I never heard of a life insurance running out before you die. Is that possible? Well, yeah, there are things called term life insurance that, you know, might be good for only a 10 year term. And if you die within the 10 years, then it pays. But if you die at the 10 year mark plus a day, um, you're outside of, of the covered term. So it would not have to pay. Bobby, I appreciate you. I'm also the producer for Money Talks, and uh, you just gave me the idea to get an insurance person on Money Talks so we can discuss that. Uh, Bobby, I appreciate you calling in, and I hope that our attorney, Kelly Kyle, was able to help you about that house in probate. Last call we have is Lee, who's on the road. Lee, drive carefully, but we're so glad you've called in to In Legal Terms. What's your comment or question? Yes, my mother's trying to uh, do her final preparations and wants to leave all her assets to the children. One of the children is disabled. Is there some way we can protect his assets, his portion of the assets from uh, disability? Yes, there absolutely is. And and that's a a great question that you have, have asked this morning. What needs to be established for your disabled sibling is called a special needs trust. And it's vital that that be set up before your mom passes away. Um, She can leave assets to that disabled child, but um, it would be for his or her benefit. It would actually be in the special needs trust. Um, You or one of the other surviving siblings could be the uh, trustee of that trust and use the funds in a way that would benefit your sibling but it would not count as his asset in determining his eligibility for Medicaid or other public benefits. Um, So yes, you certainly can do things and it needs to be done right away. If not, um, I've seen this happen in cases where um, the, the child is immediately disqualified from the Medicaid or other benefits that they're receiving and they only get requalified when those assets have been completely depleted, when they've been used to pay for their care during the interim. So, um, you know, it it all goes to um, pay for care that would have been paid for by Medicaid otherwise. So definitely encourage your mother to uh, take that step of not only doing her her final preparation, as you, you said, in the way of estate planning, but it absolutely needs to include a special needs trust for that disabled child. Liz, I think we could do a whole other show on special needs trust, absolutely. Yeah, it's something that is so very much needed, but if it's not there um, at the time of death, uh, it causes tremendous complications. Thank you, Lee. We appreciate you calling in. Uh, Folks, we have one and a half minutes left. Kelly, do you have any words of wisdom? I mean, I think the, the key that you said was that people need to plan, and the and sooner the better. Absolutely. You know, again, COVID has just really brought all of this home, and um, people can have such difficulties caused by a failure to plan. So uh, we encourage people to do estate planning. Um, do it while you can. We have actually had to get some estate plans done in a very short period of time here recently and you know people typically don't come down with uh, fatal illnesses overnight they generally know that they need to do this for a while but it's only when time is getting short for a lot of people that they really see the need for doing it and in a lot of times we can get it done in a lot of others we can't so please Take the time while you're able to do your planning. Your family will thank you for it. It makes things go so much smoother for them. It's always a a terrible thing to lose a family member, but when you have made things so much easier for them, um, it, it just makes that loss, I guess, a little bit easier to bear. It's just a set of instructions. Really for that's right. That's right. It, it's your way of saying what you want to happen, who you want to be in charge, 
And if you don't do it, then the court will be the one uh, put in that place of, of having to decide those things. And it may not go the way that you would want it to. Always a pleasure. Kelly Kyle, thank you so much for being on our show today. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Richard. Always good to be with you. That's going to wrap up today's In Legal Terms. Our call screener today has been Java Chapman, and our board engineer in Jackson is Jay White. For Professor Richard Gershon, who still hosts from his lovely dining room uh, near the University of Mississippi School of Law, I'm Liz Gill. Join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. for In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast.